we advance here to the next slide. All right. Well, I am JC Milius. I'm with Nebraska Extension in Gage County. I'm a 4 -er there. So um, I live in Jefferson County. I work in Gage County. So everything um, for me is right there on that Kansas border. We come to Kansas a lot for, for a lot of things. So I sometimes um, consider myself part of, part of the crew, but you know, I'm, I'm a Nebraskan, but Kansan at heart, <laughs> maybe. So anyway, um, my background is in textiles, clothing, and design for my undergrad. And then I also have um, a teaching degree as well. So that's a little bit about me in a nutshell. I, um, I do a lot of work in the junction of college and career readiness, um, entrepreneurship and uh, science engineering and technology. And I am also the state fair superintendent for the fashion show and also the clothing area. So um, it's pretty hard to get, get the textiles out of me. I, um, it is my first love. So if I, I always said that if I could have um, moved away from the farm, I, I might've considered um, being a, a textile designer or some sort of fashion designer. So Farm farming is in my blood, so that didn't happen. Didn't work out for me, but I I do love being able to share my um, passion with 4-H youth and with the volunteers that teach them. So um, this session was kind of surprising to me when Shane asked me to focus on textile science because it's not something that a lot of people really think about as a thing, actually. So um, it is kind of it is a, a pretty popular career. There are jobs um, all across the world in this area of textile science. So I do want to like mention some of the things that uh, people can do in this career field because many people aren't really aware of textile science as a career. So what is it? Um, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is a career that's based around the science of textiles. So um, a lot of people, when they think about this, probably the most obvious place that um, this work is being done is in like textile manufacturing. A lot of the um, materials that we wear and um, that are used in our daily lives in like um, home decor and our clothing, all of those have to be passed, um, have to go past tests. So there's some standards, um, ASTM and those types of standards that have to be passed for not only for our safety, but for the environmental safety. So that's kind of the biggest um, career path for someone with a degree in textile science. But then there's also all sorts of offshoots for um, those that are interested some being like uh, criminal crime labs, um, chemistry labs. The medical field also has um, several opportunities for textile scientists. Um, one that people don't really think about is um, in the mechanical uh, manufacturing side. So um, those people that are developing the washers and dryers, uh, they need to know about textiles. So a lot of times they'll hire a textile scientist to um, kind of come and, and uh, help them develop their products. So that's kind of the gist of textile science. Um, recently, uh, technology has kind of made its way into this textile science part as well. Um, not a lot of people are totally familiar with the advances in technology, but there have been quite a few in the textile industry. I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about that because I do have some other things I would rather touch on. So first, first things first, um, most of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight are um, found in the uh, STEAM clothing curricula here. So all of this curricula is available on Shop 4-H. So um, what, I, what I have on the screen here is the STEAM clothing one fundamentals. Uh, so that's this guy right here. That's the beginning level. Steam clothing two, simply sewing. That's um, as the youth begin to advance their skills a little bit more, then um, that's kind of the intermediate level. And then also the uh, steam clothing three, a stitch further. So that's more advanced. Um, that's 
that's along the lines of some of those advanced sewing techniques like um, tailoring and couture that you, you might think of when you think of sewing. So all of these uh, manuals are, um, they're thick. First off, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a copy here. So um, they, do, they do have a lot of content in them, but they, they focus all along the science, engineering, uh, technology, art, and mathematics of textiles. So um, as you may um, know, maybe you know about this curriculum, maybe you don't, but a lot of um, people use it as um, kind of a instructional manual for sewing. But these manuals are, are a whole lot more. So not only do they do they provide that instruction for, for beginner to advanced sewing, um, but they also provide um, some activities for science. Um, so all, all of the science experiments that I'm going to show you tonight are out of these books. But um, really what I, what I love about these manuals is the versatility of them. So um, a beginning 4 h -er can pick up the STEAM clothing one fun fundamentals and they can basically read the book, teach themselves how to do the basic so skills of sewing. Um, a, a club leader can pick it up and can mentor someone through um, the skills that they need to learn at which, whichever um, level or whichever age they're beginning at. But um, conversely, a classroom teacher could also pick up the manual and they could do one of these experiments with their class. So these manuals are big, they're kind of expensive also, but they are very versatile and can be used for many different things. The other one is Beyond the Needle. This one is more along the lines of the design elements and principles um, around, um, around clothing, uh, around textiles. So a lot of it is like fabric manipulation and those types of things. So I did just want to give a quick um, explanation of what all of these things are. So let's move on. Um, okay. So I have kind of three different experiments that I am hoping to kind of set up for you tonight. Um, so the first one being Fabric Zap. This one is in the Steam Clothing One manual. I'm not going to like give you the lesson plan because I don't necessarily think that you need that because you have access to all of these books. So if you want like more details, um, check it out in this, this manual. Um, so I am going to give you kind of the, the overview of it, the gist of it, that type of thing. So Fabric Zap is one of those great experiments that transcends um, outside of clothing. So not only does it um, apply to, to clothing and textiles, but it's also something that um, students can use in, in their daily life. So um, it's all about the generation of static electricity and um, the, the youth get to observe how fabrics relate to the static electricity. Um, oops, did I do that? That's the next one. That one comes from the Steam Clothing 2 manual. And um, this one is all about chemical reactions as they uh, react with fibers. So a lot, of, um, a lot of people are pretty familiar with the idea of like burning fabric to figure out the fiber content. That's a, a pretty popular thing to do. Um, while I love that one, that one's probably one of my favorite things because kids love to um, burn things. But um, I do also love this chemical reaction one, the oops, did I do that? Because um, it's kind of unexpectedly fun to see the, the ways that the chemicals interact with the fibers. Then the last one that I wanna highlight is called I'm Melting, I'm Melting. And this one also comes from the Steam Clothing 2 manual. This one um, is something that's very practical for, um, for anyone's life. So basically um, the idea behind this one is that the youth understand that whatever clothing they wear outside um, impacts how hot they're going to be outside. So this one's pretty practical which is why I'm highlighting it for you as well. Okay, so you'll have to bear with me. I have um, kind of set, set up some things um, with these three experiments. I have a lot of stuff on my counter right now. So um, I'm gonna try and juggle all of it, but do bear with me. 
Um, and then we'll kind of do some questions at the end. I have an overhead camera set up. It's the real sketchy setup. So um, <laughs> hopefully it stays up the entire time I am talking here, but um, I will be kind of switching back and forth uh, between this camera, the presentation and the overhead camera. So bear with me. All right, so the first experiment that I'm hoping to highlight, first off, hold on. Time out. Does anyone have any questions about the, um, the beyond or not beyond the, the steam clothing? I'm losing words right now. The steam clothing curricula or anything like that before we get going here. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll start out with the first experiment. So this is actually one that I like to do in after an after school setting probably my favorite place to do this, but it can be done with one person. It can also be done with a group of 4-Hers as well. I've done this at a, at a club meeting too. So it's, it's kind of a fun thing. Um, all right. So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you the gist of it, and then I'm going to move to the other camera. Okay. So um, in the book, you'll notice that there's a table like this. There's a table like this for almost every single experiment. Um, the idea is that the youth um, be able to record the data that they observe from that particular experiment. So um, Fabric Zap, um, as you imagine, we're going to be testing different um, properties of the uh, fibers. So, uh, there's several of them that we have, and I've I've come up with um, fabric samples for all of them. I'll show you all of this here in just a second. But um, most of these are things that are easily obtained um, at a uh, like a thrift shop or at a fabric shop. If you have one of those clothes, we don't always have access to those. So make do with with what you what you have. So um, we'll be testing wool, silk cotton, nylon, polyester. And then I always like to do my hair. It's kind of, everyone has hair usually. So, um, or there's usually hair in the room if not everyone has hair. So I like to do the hair. Um, basically, I, I do like them to do this. What is the fiber content, the fiber category? So um, all of the samples that I have are 100% whatever they are. Um, so 100% wool, 100% soap, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the fiber category. So that is like um, natural fibers or synthetic fibers. And in STEAM 1, um, all of this is scaffolded if you kind of follow through the, the manuals. But since we're just kind of jumping into it, um, I'll give you kind of a, a hint um, if you aren't aware of uh, the, the classifications of fiber. So Wool is a natural fiber. Natural fibers come from plants or animals. And um, wool is considered a protein fiber. So um, natural protein. Silk is also a natural protein fiber. Cotton is a natural cellulose fiber. Um, nylon is a synthetic or man-made fiber, as is polyester. And you may have guessed, but hair is pretty natural although some people um, dye their hair to unnatural colors, so, but still considered natural, still works for natural. Okay, so there are several things that we need to kind of record um, throughout the experiment. So um, we'll need to keep an eye on, um, we're gonna use some sand and actually here, you know what? I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna show you what I got with my other camera here. I hope. Ah, can you see it? Okay. So the setup kind of includes a um, large dish that has sand in it. And um, you also need some balloons that are blown up to approximately the same size. Balloons um, are great for static electricity. Um, and then you also need some fabric samples. So I have a wool sample here. I have a polyester sample right here, and I've labeled all of these, a cotton sample and a silk sample, and then also a nylon sample. My nylon sample, I'm not gonna lie to you, isn't the best nylon sample, 
I'd probably rather have something like ripstop nylon or something along those lines. But and for everyone watching this at home, if you make sure you're in, if you go to the top right hand corner, you should see a view button. And if you make sure you're in speaker view, you'll see the full screen and not just a small window. Thanks, Shane. Yep. All right. So um, I've also taken time to label all of my balloons so that that we know which ones go with which. And then um, the idea is that you're going to rub the corresponding fiber with the, the um, balloon. So you're going to rub it 20 times. Okay, so we're trying to create a static charge. So wherever you rub the balloon, then you're going to kind of bring the balloon down to the sand and you need a ruler also. And then you're going to try and record the sand or sand salt, you could use either, will start to jump up toward the balloon. So I'm gonna do that right now. And I, it's helpful if you have another person, I'm all by myself here. so. Um, I'm going to try and do all the things. So as you bring it down, you'll be able to start hearing it before you see it. So I don't know if you can hear that or not, but so all of it is, is kind of coming up to the top of my balloon. So you can see the salt on there. Oops. Let me turn it a little better for you. So there's a fair amount of salt on there. I did notice that it's it started jumping around the one inch mark, well, maybe maybe a little bit more than one inch. But then um, you want to kind of keep track of how much salt is actually on your balloon. So then um, I like to print out that uh, sheet for all of my people that are doing this. And then um, they would write the approximate height for the wool would be around one inch, the approximate, approximate amount. So um, you just kind of make a judgment on how much salt is on there. So um, I'm going to say like an area that's around, well, here I have a ruler, I guess I can measure around two and a half inches by two inches that has the salt on it. And so I would record that, the approximate amount, and then approximate time. So that's when it, it's helpful to have another person um, that you can time like when the sand starts falling off. So my sand, I'm kind of shaking it a little bit here. Um, it's not really coming off very much. Oh, sorry, here, out of my camera view. So you'll still notice that I have quite a bit of salt on there. I don't know why I keep calling it sand, probably because I played in sand all day today. But um, for the most part, the salt is all staying on there. So it will lose static charge over time. So you can kind of turn it back and forth. Um, but you do wanna kind of keep track of how long the charge, how long the uh, balloon keeps the static charge. So I'm not gonna mess too much with that. I'm just gonna move on to the next one. So my next one is cotton. So I'll do the same exact process, rub it the 20 times. Okay, so um, then the idea is to flip it over again and do the same exact thing. So um, at the beginning, we would probably do some sort of hypothesis uh, with this um, thing. So which fiber do you think is, is the most, um, would cause the most static electricity increase? Um, and, and maybe you would come up with cotton, maybe you would come up with wool, but then you would test it all out and see which one. So I, it's starting to jump right around three fourths of an inch. And I've got a bigger area on this one. 
So this area is three and a half by three inches. So we'll see how long it keeps its static charge here. It's kind of fun because the salt will kind of jump around <laughs> on the balloon. So, okay. So then you would record all that on, on the thing. And then you would go through all of the other fibers as well. And then after that, then you need to come up with some sort of conclusion. So um, out of the wool, the silk, the cotton, nylon, the polyester, or the hair, um, which do you think would be the most, have the most static charge? Anyone have a guess? And you can always unmute yourself if you want to, or you can put it in the chat. Hair, that's a good guess. Yeah, I was gonna say, I always think of hair. <laughs> yeah, hair is very staticky. So that is a, a pretty good guess. Polyester, that's also a good guess. So this is kind of a trick question. It does kind of depend upon, <laughs> it does depend upon the environment um, that you are doing this in. So if it's a humid environment, may not work quite as well. You may have mixed, mixed things, but um, if it's a drier environment, then um, polyester is, is one of the more staticky things. So you will probably um, find that it, it does have the most static. So wool one of, is actually one of the least, which, you know, you always think of static with hair. Um, so a lot of people will guess wool, um, but it's, it's actually not. Okay, so give me just a second. I'm going to try to move all of this uh, static and salt stuff out of the way. And then um, I'll move on to the, oops, did I do that? So hang on one sec. I should have played some music or something. Sorry, sorry about that. All right, moving right along to, oops, did I do that? So let me share my screen one more time. Actually, probably two more times here. Okay, move on to, oops, did I do that? So this experiment is um, trying to figure out the chemical reactions for different fibers. So the fibers that we're going to use for this one are cotton, the wool or silk. So you, you don't have to use both, just, um, just one or the other, a polyester fiber, and then also an acetate. So um, once again, I would have them fill in this particular part. And then the reaction that would happen during the, the use of the acetone and the uh, use of the bleach. So we're going to test them with two different chemicals that are pretty common. So fingernail polish remover is a common household chemical and chlorine bleach is also a common, common household chemical. So at this point in time, um, maybe some of you know this, but um, do you have any hypothesis, hypotheses on what's going to happen? Crickets. <laughs> okay, well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so we'll just, we'll just go for it. So we do actually in these, in this um, manual, there is like a hypothesis for the, the people who have no clue. So um, the hypothesis for this particular one, let me see if I can find it is, Okay, 
Common household chemicals will react with synthetic fibers more than with natural fibers since synthetic fibers are made using chemicals. So um, that's kind of the canned hypothesis. You don't have to use it if you don't want to, um, but we don't leave you hanging usually. And there are some good ones in the chat now. Oh, good. I just didn't give you long enough. Oh, look, we've had a couple of you that have done this before. <laughs> okay, so the bleach is going to change the color. You've had bleach eat a hole through your genes. Oh, that's unfortunate for those genes. Acetate will dissolve in the acetone. Good thinking there with the, the same name. Okay, bleach will dissolve wool. Y'all have done this before. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to do the experiment here. So um, once again, would have them fill this out. So cotton is a natural cellulose fiber. Wool or silk, so we're going to use wool, um, is a natural protein fiber. Polyester is a synthetic um, chemical fiber. And acetate is a synthetic cellulose fiber. So it's a regenerated cellulose. So it's been made out of plants or repurposed. So to do this experiment, um, you need, let me switch cameras once again, juggling here. Okay, gonna come faster this time. Ah, there it is. Okay, so you need little tiny fabric swatches of each of those things. So this one is my fabric swatch of the polyester. So I've got, oh, that is, it's just a fiber. Okay, I thought it was like a hair or something. So I've got two of them in two different containers. I'm going to put the bleach in one and I'm going to put the acetone in the other. My cotton is actually a printed cotton. This would probably work better if you had like a colored cotton. I should have grabbed one, but I, I didn't. Um, and then I'm gonna get rid of the silk out of here and just keep my little wool right there. And my wool, all right, maybe I'll scooch it over here a little bit so you can see. And then this last one is acetate. So it's right there. So then in each one of these, so first I have just some um, nail polish remover. It's 100% pure acetone. That's the most important part. So make sure that it is the acetone. Make sure that it's not um, like something that you would um, have like watered down acetone or, or whatnot. I have no idea what is in other types of, of stuff. So, um, then you're just going to pour a little bit of the chemical so that it covers just barely covers the, um, fiber. So put a little bit more in there. It's also nice if you can keep one um, sample of each for the, the, um, the, oh my gosh, my brain is gone today. Um, the control, that's the word I'm trying to come up with. And then I poured a little bit of bleach. This is just regular non, um, this is just regular chlorine bleach that you would purchase at the grocery store or wherever. Um, but I put it in a container because I knew that there's pressure for me to pour on camera and that never goes well. Okay, so just kind of pour it in there enough to cover each of them. And ideally, if you are not in a well ventilated area, it would be really great if you would like cover all of these with um, some saran wrap, then you could take and swirl the um, chemical and the fiber around in the, the thing. Otherwise, you can also use a spoon. Make sure you use the acetone spoon for all of the acetone and make sure to use the um, bleach spoon for all of the things with the bleach in it. So I'm already starting to get some chemical reactions that have happened. So probably the quickest reaction um, that you can see is the acetate here um, in the acetone. So it is almost entirely 
dissolved in the acetone. It's um, on my spoon and it's kind of become like a slimy, disgusting mess on my spoon. So um, one fun chemical reaction has happened. Otherwise, it doesn't really look like anything productive. Anything else is being done with the acetate or acetone, I mean, with all of our other fibers. So we'll leave those for just a little bit and we'll come back to them. So, so far, it looks like the bleach has changed the color, I don't know how well you can see this or not, um, of the um, dye that was used on the cotton. So it's basically removed all of that printing. Um, so we can compare this one to this one because you can still see the printing, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, hard to see on that camera, huh? Um, it doesn't look like anything is, has happened to the polyester so far. So comparing the two polyesters, they pretty well look the same. Um, there's something going on with this wool though. So um, as you can see, there's nothing happening in, maybe you can't see, in the um, acetate, acetone blah, wool, but there is something happening in the bleach wool. So the, the wool in the bleach is kind of bubbling up and um, if I would leave this for a while yet, it, this reaction would take, take a long time. Um, probably 10 more minutes, 20 more minutes, depending on um, how much I stir it and fiddle with it here. But um, you can already see that it's starting, the wool is starting to get damaged by the bleach. And then our last one, our acetate, is not really doing anything in that bleach mixture. So, um, so then I would have the youth make an observation, what's going on with each of the things, and then record it on this paper here. So cotton didn't really do anything in the fingernail polish, the wool, silk, same thing, polyester, not so much, nothing. And then the acetate uh, dissolved, completely dissolved. The chlorine bleach um, in the, co the cotton, it did get rid of the color, the coloration. And I think that um, if you would leave it long enough, maybe, um, maybe it would get damaged. Um, perhaps if you would leave it for several hours, the, the fibers would, would damage. And then the polyester, nothing's really happened in that, that bleach. The acetate, nothing happened in the bleach, but the wool um, has definitely is definitely going through some chemical changes. So you can even see that it's continuing here. It's got a bunch of white bubbles on there. So that one's kind of fun to see that um, you are right. Bleach will dissolve wool and acetate will dissolve in the acetone. Great job. Your hypothesis were all correct there. So along with all of these experiments, there is um, that, that part of the experiential learning where we ask questions to share, have the, have the youth share, process, generalize, and apply. So that all kind of happens at the end of each of these experiments. Um, let me switch my webcam here real fast. But basically, um, the, the goal of these questions is for them to, to really um, process exactly what they did, what happened, and how, um, why, it, why it matters, why it matters to them. So um, the, basically, that the idea behind this is that we want them to make a connection to their daily life. So maybe that connection would be something along the lines of, be very careful when you are um, doing laundry and you're wearing things made out of wool. Um, be very careful when you're wearing your acetate prom, prom gown that you don't um, get, take your fingernail polish off and get acetone all over your acetate prom gown. I don't know. Anyway, so those are just some things 
Uh, question in the chat, what percentage of wool is best for experiments? Um, to be entirely honest with you, I really would shy away from anything under 100% for all of the things. It just, things happen a little quicker when they are 100%. Although um, some experiments can can um, result out of, out of the percentage wars as well. So for instance, with our acetate here, if it was only 50% acetate, um, typically uh, one of the, either the warp or the weft thread is that acetate and then whatever else is um, in there won't have any sort of reaction. So it will, it's kind of funny because all you'll see are the, the fibers of, or the yarns of the, let's say warp that are left. So that all the fibers will be going in one direction. So that's kind of fun to see too. Um, I typically go with 100% because it's just a little easier to make things work when it's 100%. That's really, that's really all. Any other questions at this point in time? So have you had any luck trying to connect to like the kids that are doing like a bimanship project so they can get the, the form to function of, you know, a type of material and then what it's going to be used for? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I do like to do these things with, with those um, youth that are doing that. It is nice for them to be able to know the limitations of and the, and the properties really of those um, fibers that they're buying their garments that are, that are made of their garments. Um, there are several more experiments that are um, in these manuals. Um, one of them, I wouldn't call it an experiment, but it is in the science section. But one, one thing that they do talk about is the, the actual properties. I think it's in, I want to say it's in level one or steam one, but they talk about the actual properties of the, um, the fibers, the fabrics. So um, where are you at? My goodness, I'm not going to find it. Okay, I did find it. All right, so they talk about things such as like um, stretch, um, hand, uh, luster. So those are just all describing words to describe the fabrics that, um, that we purchase. So, or that we make sometimes, sometimes we make fabric. Um, but like luster is something that has a sheen to it. Um, hand is how, how it feels in your hand. So if it's, if it's soft, if it's drapeable, those types of things. So, um, all, all of these experiments do really apply to the things that we would purchase in a store or, or um, things that we would make too. So I don't know if I answered your question, Shane, or not, but. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, I will mention this because I am thinking about it right now. But to dispose of all these chemicals, um, you'll want to take special care um, as to not mix them. Um, but it is helpful to kind of put all the, um, bleach in one container and then you'll want to separate the fibers. You don't want them to go down the drain. Um, so I usually use a spoon to kind of fish it out. And then, um, I throw the fibers or the fabrics away into a trash can and then, um, dispose of the chemicals. So just, just a quick FYI for you. Okay, as I do that, I am going to kind of move this stuff out of my way. Okay, that one was a quicker cleanup. <laughs> okay, let me go back to sharing my screen here. Oh no. <laughs> It exited, sorry. Okay, everyone see my screen again? Oh, good, okay. All right, so I'm melting, I'm melting. So this one um, really highlights the um, fact that different colors of fabrics impact how hot we are when it's really hot outside. So this is kind of a longer experiment. So we probably won't be able to see like the final res results of it 
um, in the time that we have left here. But I do want to show you the setup because this, I do love doing this experiment with youth because it, it does really click something in their brain. Like, oh, if I wear this, then I'm going to be really hot. Um, so it, it is kind of fun to see that the end result. So for this one, um, you need different colors of fabrics. So they have you do five swatches. You wouldn't have to do five swatches if you don't want to, but um, it is it is nice to see several different colors and how they interact with um, the ice that we're going to use. Here's my spoiler alert for you. Um, so you do want to pick up uh, several different colors. So um, I'm I have a white one because um, you know everyone thinks of wearing white, but my white is a flannel material. So just to prove that it's only color that we're um, messing with here. Um, I chose a, a flannel white. You can choose all of the same, same fabrics if you want, or you can mix it up kind of like I did. Um, if you want to like be really, um, controlled, have a really controlled experiment, then I would say su suggest doing like all like quilters cotton, but I don't know. I like, I like throwing cogs in the wrench here. So, um, flannel, cotton flannel is one of my swatches. Another one, my next slightest is a gray knit. Um, sorry, pulled on the wrong direction. Gray knit. Uh, the next one is a red quilters cotton. And then a purple quilters cotton. I think this one is, I don't know. It feels like it's like a light flannel. The red one does. It doesn't feel entirely like quilters cotton. And then I also have a black quilters cotton. So to do this, I'm going to flip the camera over. So you would, you would go through all this again. So you would do the fiber color, um, the fiber content from the care label. So everything that I have here is 100% cotton, even including that um, knit fabric that I pulled and that flannel fabric. And then you would describe the fabric category. So um, this is something that is also scaffolded in that um, in the, the curriculum as well. But um, it's just for our purposes tonight. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but there are different um, structures of fabric. So uh, the woven fabrics are like all of the flannels would be woven. The quilters cotton would be wo woven. The um, my gray knit fabric that I said um, is a jersey knit, so it would fall under knit. Um, but then there's also non-woven fabrics like um, olefin would be an example of that. Belt would be an example of a non-woven. Okay, let me switch cameras one more time. I promise this is the last time. Oh, I didn't get that released. Okay. So I got some ice cubes before I set this up, um, started the Zoom here, so you didn't have to watch me get ice cubes. So um, they're already a little bit melty, but it's okay. It's not a big deal. So for each of our fabrics here, you'll want one ice cube. You wanna pick something that's pretty similar in size. Um, so put it in a Ziploc bag. So I'm gonna go with, oh, and then all my ice cubes have kind of melted together. So you'll wanna get all of the air out of the Ziploc bag. So each of the ice cubes will go into the Ziploc, just like this. So while I'm doing this, um, does anyone have a hypothesis of what's going to happen or what's going to be the result of our experiment? You can blurt it out or you can type it in the chat. Okay. So I have one more here. So this You'll want to pick out um, some fabrics that you don't really care about, the fabric swatches. So um, don't make these be like your very favorite 
uh, wool sweater or something like that, um, because we are going to put some staples through these. Okay. So, oh, we do have a hypothesis. Darker fabrics will melt ice faster in sunlight. Okay. I like that one. That one's good. So the canned hypothesis they gave us is light colored fabric will cause the ice cube to melt more slowly than dark colored fabrics. Okay, so basically the same thing that you said. So we're going to make like little purses. I don't know, I, that's what I'm gonna call them. A little purse for each one of these ice cubes. So fold it up small, and then you're going to kind of fold the fabric around it. And then you're going to find a stapler that I'm really hoping I brought. Apparently not. So you would staple it right here and that would kind of keep it together. Um, ideally, you don't wanna staple through the plastic bag that you just shoved in there and then put it in a bowl. So the idea is to have it like wrapped up tight in its little purse. Yep, that's not gonna stay. Um, all right, well, oh, there it is. And then you would do that, <laughs> you would do that for all of the rest of them. So I have a lot of air in this one yet. So you would make little purses for all of them. And then you would set them out in a sunny place. Um, so I don't have a sunny place, but I did bring this lamp um, that is shining a bunch of light on our camera area here I'm also making it extremely hot so I know that it's working <laughs> um, <laughs> I should not have worn this sweater uh, <laughs> so you'll make little purses for each of these little ice cubes and then you'll just let them melt so you will want to check them periodically so don't staple them like super great um, and throughout the experiment, yeah, I'm doing really good at, at making little purses, as you can tell. Um, throughout the experiment, you'll want to check back and see how it's going. So if, if certain ones are melting faster than others, and see if your hypothesis is correct. Maybe. Okay. All right. So there they all are in their little purses. Some are better than others. Yours will be better because you'll have a stapler. But anyway, um, so this is kind of the gist of this one. Um, you'll check back, see which ones will melt, and then um, try and keep track of the time. So um, some of them may be melted a little bit faster than others. I would venture to guess that the dark ones will be a shorter time to melt than what the longer ones will. So that's just kind of a, a guess there. Um, Melissa says thicker fabrics won't melt as quickly. Um, also darker colors will melt faster. That's a great hypothesis as well. Um, so really this one, we're just testing the color. Um, it doesn't exactly matter um, with the um, thickness of the fabric for this particular experiment. So you notice that I have some that are thicker and some that aren't thicker. So like our my black one here isn't thicker. If we were in sunlight, this would go a lot faster, but um, the black one, I did this the other night and the black one did melt. Um, I think it was in like 12 minutes that it totally melted. And the white one, even in, in the flannel, it took, um, I think it was 23, 24 minutes, if I remember correctly. So even the flannel didn't exactly, didn't exactly matter for it. So um, that one is kind of a fun experiment. Like the others, it does have some um, questions at the end that you can um, share, process, generalize, and apply. And get back to this here. I'll share some um, resources with you that I have. Okay, so move the cameras. 
All right, so some, some resources that I have um, that I'm aware of, and I know that there are like tons of them out there, but if you're interested in textiles at all, um, this is kind of a fun investment. It's called the textile kit. It is kind of pricey, so, so be aware of that. But um, inside of the kit are different um, fibers and fabric samples. So you basically have access to all sorts of different, um, different things that maybe you've never been aware of. So like this one is a linen fabric. This one is um, a linen fabric. Let me see if I can find some more interesting ones. Here is Tyvek, which is made from olefin. Um, so basically it just shows you all sorts of different fabrics. And then it, it's a really great place to to get samples for these experiments. So um, the acetate that I use tonight is actually from this textile kit. I just cut little pieces off of it. Um, some other things that, that there are, are uh, mood fabrics is a really great place to find, find fabrics that are 100% whatever, um, because everything is uh, just kind of listed on their website. It's an easy website to find things. Um, if you're interested more in the testing of textiles, there are a couple different um, videos here that I, I like. Um, this one is actually inside of a textile testing laboratory, kind of fun to see the, the testing that they do. And then um, if you're into the burn test, which once again is my favorite, I probably should have showed you guys tonight, but um, I feel like everyone knows how to do it and does it. So I, I thought I would highlight some other things. It's also highlighted in um, the STEAM 2 uh, curriculum. And then more of a nod to what we just did with the melting of the clothes, or not melting of the clothes, the melting of the ice in uh, that last experiment is the sun protective clothing. And um, this one, I kind of like the, um, I think it was like Good Morning America or something like that, did a experiment where they um, tested the colors of the clothing, but also um, the thickness of the, the clothing and the body temperature. So that's just another way of illustrating the same concept that we did with the ice cubes. All right. so. That kind of brings brings my stuff to an end. Does anyone have questions for me about anything? Would you say uh, any of these activities can be done with any size group or would it be best to try to keep this to like a dozen or what have you found works well? You know, I've I've done this with as few as one and I've done it with as many as I think 12, 13. So I would say that you probably don't want to like try and manage um, a bunch of um, like kids with chemicals um, at one time, but you could do groups of two. So um, that might be an option for you as well. I've done um, the burn test with a group of like 35 before. That was a, a mistake. So <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that, but keeping, keeping the fire to a minimum is always good. Risk management, right? <laughs> and, and some of these activities I've seen, we did at a field day once, um, which was very possible with larger groups, but it took many volunteers yeah. to um, help make sure things didn't go awry. Yep, for sure. Yep, you're using potentially dangerous things um, with the chemicals and the fire. So, but things that are the um, static electricity one, that could very easily be done with several youth. The ice melting one could be done with several youth. Um, there's also one that's called Raincoats for Cotton Balls. That's another one of my favorites. Um, I wanted to show you, but I didn't want to take you to my bathroom. Um, so it can be done without a bathroom, but it's, you know. Anyway, um, so that one is a fun one that can be done with quite a few youth at a time. 
as well. It looks like there's the one in the chat too. Oh, do the STEAM manuals cover textiles for the home? Um, to some extent. So in, if I remember right, there is a table in there um, that, yeah, here it is. Okay. Oh, you're not going to be able to see that. Sorry. Um, so there's a table. Yes, I'm trying to show you something that you can't read. Um, there's a table that outlines all of the, um, the fibers um, that existed at this time. So this book is getting some age to it. It was made in 2014. Um, so if that tells you, there's all sorts of new, new fibers that come into play all the time. So um, it does kind of talk about the uses of the different fibers. And some of them are very specific to home decor. For, for instance, um, like hemp and jute is, is often not worn, but it is usually used in carpet backing. Um, so that's one example. I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's, it doesn't tell you how to upholster things, if that's helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. I, I hope that you get to, to play a little bit. Um, these, these experiments are kind of fun. Um, they're outside of the ordinary and unexpected. So, and, and it does you know, people, everyone has to wear clothes. So it is kind of fun to know that there, there is some science behind the clothes that we wear. All right, so as you guys are thinking of, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. I will share, so um, I did purchase some curriculum for everyone that came on tonight. So uh, we'll be sending you guys um, copies of the STEAM, the first version, and then there's a maker's guide that goes along with the, the first couple of curriculum pieces that are is really useful. So we'll give you guys some ideas of these um, experiments as well as some ways you can apply them with your club members. Because that is one of the things you're trying to do in all of these sessions is give some really tangible things you can go out and do in a club to engage kids maybe in a different way than they have been in the past. And I'll put in one plug before I stop sharing my screen. So this is part of a series. Um, we have our next one on September 30th, where we're going to learn about animal science. Uh, we've got some great examples there and some good activities as well. And we've got a, um, a great speaker that night as well. All right, let's, uh, I think there was one more question in the chat and we've got time. We'll try to wrap up in just a minute or two, but yeah, there's time for a couple of questions. Well, thank you guys for all being on. Um, yeah, you could totally do this with older project members or um, some of them are even fun for, for the younger kids as well. So experiment, it's yeah. kind of fun. And if you have any junior leaders, um, so the, the one of the reasons we wanted to highlight this, this curriculum is really easy if you just wanna hand this off to a junior leader and say, hey, lead this activity. It's all done and prepared you know, that you can work with them and kind of spread out the teaching to your whole group. 